Hello everyone, today I'll be going over how websites work. I'll give an overview of the different parts and how they connect, and I'll mention some common design patterns and languages along the way. You may find this useful if you're considering building a website of your own, or if you're preparing for the design portion of an engineering interview. This is not just for engineers though, I'll try to explain this in a way that anyone can understand. I've been a software engineer for well over a decade, working at a variety of companies from small startups to large corporations, including Google, LinkedIn, and Microsoft. I've learned that there are many ways to solve a problem. Some of the information in this video may eventually change or become obsolete. That's just the ever-evolving nature of technology. Some of the languages mentioned in this video and the technologies may change, but the fundamental ideas behind these design patterns are not likely to change anytime soon. I'll be using my website, Veritable Reviews, to demonstrate some of these concepts. The mission of Veritable Reviews is to provide a quick, easy, and concise way to see what people think about things. And it's completely free. So if you're tired of reading through a ton of reviews about something and still not knowing if you want to try it or not, then this is the site for you. There you'll find reviews for all of your favorite shows, games, music, and books. You can see the vote breakdown. You can expand an item to see more details. Descriptions are here and comments are down here. You can search for what you want to see and you can sort and filter the results. So for example, I can look for role-playing games that are on the Nintendo Switch and then sort by title or date. And if you sign up, you can add your own reviews. Again, sign up is completely free and you'll even earn some fun medals by adding items and reviews. So head on over to Veritable Reviews and enjoy. With that out of the way, let's jump into part one of how websites work. Let's start with the client, also known as the front end. It's what the user sees and where the user scrolls and clicks. This is commonly written in JavaScript or some variant of built on top of JavaScript. There are some tools and libraries like jQuery to enhance the coding process, and a popular choice for modern front end devs is React. CSS will help you set the look and feel of your page. When a user interacts with something on the client, like clicking a button, a request is sent to the service, also known as the backend. This is usually where the logic will happen. Typically, this part is written in a high-level language like Java or Python. You may still find a lot of sites written in PHP as well. The service often has to fetch data from somewhere, so it reaches out to a database. There are many options here, many of which are SQL-based. NoSQL options like MongoDB are common as well. But how does the user request get from the client to the service? Well, there's something in between them. This is a web server. The web server's job is to route traffic to the right place. This typically runs on an OS like Linux. Nginx is a popular web server that often works with the web server gateway interface like GUnicorn. You'll still find lots of Apache servers running as well. We'll dive more into web servers in part three of this video. But what does the request from the client to the server look like? As with most things, there are several ways to do this. An application programming interface, or API, is like a contract that helps the client and the server know how to communicate with each other. The most common I've seen are REST and GraphQL. Let's take a closer look at these two. REST, or Representational State Transfer, and GraphQL are really just different ways to do the same thing. For a RESTful API, I like to think of it as one call for one datum. Use this when you want some specific information. You want your request to be item potent. That is, the same operation multiple times should return the same result. Along those lines, you have to watch out for duplicate calls. For instance, if a user accidentally clicks a purchase button twice, even though this should be blocked on the client side, you don't want them to be charged twice. You can prevent this by including some authorization token in the request. So the service actually knows that it's the same request. APIs can be stateful or stateless. REST is stateless, meaning you shouldn't assume that a previous call has set things up for the next call. Each call should have everything it needs to complete the request. Also, with the RESTful API, the work is usually done on the server side. That means the request comes in, some logic is applied, and the results are returned to the client. Now let's compare this to GraphQL. I like to think of GraphQL as one call for multiple data, or more appropriately, one call for custom data. In GraphQL, you construct a query to fetch specific objects and fields that you want, or use a mutation to change them. Resolvers decide where to pull the data from, and schemas decide what the data looks like. These are combined 
from multiple sources and returned. The data is usually returned in JavaScript object notation or JSON format. JSON is really just an easy to read way to set key value pairs. The JSON results are then returned to the client. REST and GraphQL aren't the only options. All you really need is an agreement between the client and the server as to how the data is requested and returned. And that's the standard flow from the client to the server. For the demos coming up in part two, we'll assume we have a setup with the choices highlighted here. Let's dive into part two to see what's happening on the back end. When building a service, there are several popular design patterns that work pretty well. Some common design patterns include model view controller or MVC and model view template or MVT. MVC is quite common for apps. I've seen and built a ton of Android apps with the MVC pattern and MVT is a great choice for websites. Let's take a closer look at the MVT design pattern now. In part one, we mentioned a RESTful API where a request comes in and is handled by the service. Here's a request coming in now. The request is ultimately routed and picked up in a view. You can think of a view like a situational view. For example, if we're looking at the home page, that's a view. Or perhaps we're trying to search for something. That's another view. Maybe there's, we're in a view of, I'm trying to log in. Editing something or converting something, there's some more views. The view looks at the request and decides what data is needed to give the correct response. So it finds a model. Models represent the data. Often, each database table has a corresponding model. For example, at Veritable Reviews, we have the concept of a show. Each show has a title, year, genre, and second genre. The corresponding show model has a field for each of these. The model also has a way to access the data. There's usually a way to find by ID or find latest or add or update. A method on the model is called and returns the data requested. The view then gets the data from the model and applies the appropriate logic to find out what needs to be returned. The view then passes the results of its work as parameters into a template. Templates represent the pieces that take up space on a page. The view fills in parameters that help the template decide what to show. So at Veritable Reviews, we've got a template for searching and a template for logging in, and another template holds all of the reviews. If I go to music and sort by popular, the view has decided to fetch popular artists and albums from the music model and return the results to the reviews template where there's a loop to display each model. Going even further, each of these reviews loads another template for details when it's expanded. In Veritable Reviews, when a user expands a row, there's a separate call to get the details for that item. Asynchronous calls like this are a great way to optimize for speed. Rather than returning all of the details for all of the items on the page, resulting in a large response, we assume the user will probably only expand a few of these rows anyway and fetch only those items on demand. So instead, we return only the titles and general info for each row in the review template. Then, if there's an interest in seeing more for a particular item, we make a call to get the details for that row and return them in a details template. So let's summarize all of this in one sentence. The client passes a request to the server, where a view takes the request and fetches data from a model and does some work, then passes the process data into a template, which fills in pieces of information and returns it to the client. And that's an example of an architectural design pattern for a backend service. Let's take a step back to see what we've covered so far. You should now understand the flow from client to service and know how the service works. So let's take a closer look at the web server for part three of this video. You can think of a web server like a traffic director. We have a request coming from the client that we want to get to the service, and we pass the request information into a URL. Let's look at the technologies that pick it up. We're using Nginx for this example. Nginx is a web server. It acts as a reverse proxy. That just means it takes the request from the client and decides where it goes. It has load balancing to make sure that the requests are distributed fairly and we don't have any bottleneck. And it has caching, which means save the things you fetch so next time we fetch it faster. It also serves static content, which is anything on the server that doesn't change. This can be things like images or style sheets. 
but we haven't gotten all the way from the client request to our backend code yet. To take this further, you can use Nginx with GUnicorn or Green Unicorn. GUnicorn is a web server gateway interface. That's whiskey. What is a whiskey, you ask? Well, it sends the request to the proper backend code, in this case, a Python web app. So let's take a look at some common frameworks for setting up the web app. If you're building a web app in Python, it's nice to have a framework that helps keep things organized. Flask and Django are two common options. In this example, we're using Django because it's great for multi-page apps and has a built-in admin interface. It also has object relational mapping, ORM, so you don't have to write raw SQL queries or use something like SQL Alchemy. And this is where we find the code for the web app. But where does the web server run? The server is usually running on an OS. You can use a container to simplify the setup and specify which parts of the OS you actually need. We'll use Docker containers for this example. There are a few parts to this. A Docker file explains how to set up the container. You can have an entry point script to do some extra setup. For instance, my entry point script waits for the database to run before continuing. You can also use YAML to specify exactly how you want to build your containers and in what order. I like to use a different Docker config for building for local testing and for final releases for production. So we've seen how the code works in parts one and two, and we've seen how to get to the code in part three. Now we just need to know where the code lives in part four. So let's talk about the environment and hosting. I mentioned Docker containers in part three, but what containers do we need? Let's start with the container for the web app. All the code and Python modules will live here. And do you remember how we get to the web app? That's right, through the web server. So let's have a container for Nginx. You may want your database to run separately as well. So let's add one more container for our database. Now the web app, the server, and the database all have a container to call home, but the containers themselves need a home. This is when we decide on where to host our website. AWS is a popular choice, we know it can handle a lot because Netflix, Twitch, and LinkedIn, and Facebook all run on AWS. On Azure, you've got Verizon, MSI, LG, and more. You'll find Verizon, Yahoo, and SAP on Google Cloud. What I'm trying to say is it doesn't really matter which one you choose. All of these are used by much larger companies, so they can certainly handle your needs. Veritable Reviews runs on Microsoft Azure. I did find one problem with the Dockerized database, though. In the event of a restart, the database would be wiped. Setting a static volume wasn't enough to stop all cases. So I decided to host the database separately on a dedicated database service. Remember when I said that all of the hosting options can handle your needs? Well, of course, Azure has many database options. So now I have a hosted database that won't get reset when the app is restarted or when the containers are rebuilt. If you're running a containerized database, you may want to consider a dedicated service. And that concludes part four of this video. You should now know where a request goes when you click on something on a website, how the request is handled and returned, how these parts are connected, and where it all lives. Please let me know if you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, or would like more content like this. And don't forget to check out Veritable Reviews to see all of this in action. Thank you and have a great day.